The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Romans 8, verses 5 and following. Pages 4 and 5 of your notes. God has established the local church <clears throat> as the classroom of Christianity. The uh, factors involved are students, called disciples in the Bible, uh, a textbook, the Bible, a professor, the pastor, teacher, and it is the ideal environment that the Lord in his wisdom has established for the spiritual matriculation of positive volition. But one other obviously critical factor, in addition to positive volition, is you must be in fellowship. So this is your opportunity to make that adjustment and focus your attention on the presentation of the information we have for you this evening. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we assemble ourselves under the imperative to grow in grace and knowledge and all the more as we see the day approaching. And we certainly see the day approaching. We thank you that you have delivered us from the air that is in the world and continue to set before our thinking the divine viewpoint of life. Bless this Bible class to that end in Christ's name. Amen. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So what we have here is categories of individuals. Those who are according to the flesh refers to those who are ruled by their STA. They have no choice really in the matter because they are born with one and the environment that they tend to be in encourages various types of STA behavior. Again, the flesh is a synonym in this for the sin nature. This group, of world, uh, uh, this group is the world of unbelievers. Again, the only restraint the unbeliever has over the sin nature is the conscience, which is able to distinguish between what is moral and what is not. The conscience is located in the soul, the living soul. It's one of the attributes of the soul, along with volition. It isn't that the unbeliever cannot see things that are bad, otherwise we wouldn't be fighting crime and other types of things. Otherwise, the unbeliever is ruled through his STA. Again, various manifestations. Some people are, even as unbelievers, good people. They're not bad or evil in that, in that sense, but they are also, but they are victims, nevertheless, of their sin nature. Though their minds are set on the things of the flesh with special emphasis on the lust pattern, and we looked up those verses to deal with, uh, for these believers to whom these, this was written, uh, the way it was before we came to Christ and got in, enlightened spiritually. Those who are according to the Spirit refers to believers in Jesus Christ. And I noted at least once in the life of a believer, that person has set their mind on the things of the Spirit under gospel hearing. The things of the Spirit, point nine, refers to the divine viewpoint of life. And this viewpoint is found in the Word of God. Look at God as His thoughts are not our thoughts. 
His ways are not our ways. Until we line ourselves up with proper teaching and instruction. And then we begin to understand the ways of God, the divine viewpoint of life. As you grow spiritually, you will be able to distinguish, obviously you'll be able to identify what sinful behavior is, as well as in yourself and in others. And you'll be able to identify things people say that constitute human viewpoint. And when you do that and you hear that, oh, that in your own mind, you process it, and that is human viewpoint, you have brought that thought into captivity for Christ. We're to bring every thought. If we start to have the wrong kind of thinking about something, we're supposed to bring the doctrine into view and judge that and not carry on with it. Verse, verse 6 builds on verse 5. Those who follow the impulses of the flesh are in the sphere of death. They are spiritually dead to God and spiritual things. They are separated from the life of God and are unable to break the cycle of sin and death. They are in bondage or enslaved. The noun translated the mindset occurs only here twice in this verse 6 and verses 7 and 27. Anyway, the, it refers to a way of thinking, an approach to life. You and I, when we get up, face a new day, we're supposed to begin to relate to things from the divine viewpoint. Prayer helps a lot. And of course, consistency in Bible class. And thirdly, association on a social level with the right people, positive people, like-minded people, people that are growing up in Christ. Because as I have pointed out again and again, the wrong kind of associations corrupt good habits, corrupt good morals, and throw you off base. You cannot consistently hang out and associate with those who are committed to STA activity and human viewpoint. You become like them. Who you associate with affects you spiritually. It, even, it includes family members, anyone else. That's why we have a doctrine of separation, to separate from those who do not have zeal and love of the truth. That's basic and fundamental for your spiritual survival. And if you violate that and consistently do so, you will be influenced by who you hang out with and associate with. And that even includes people who have peeled off spiritually from this church. You can say otherwise, but it will happen. You won't, they won't rise to your level. You'll go down to their level. This is true of everything, and that's why the Bible says we are to be, uh, to the best of our ability, yes, you can go to work, yes, you can go to school, but you must, even in those environments, keep your armor on, keep your guard up, and process what people are saying or trying to influence you with. Because that's all they have. That's all they can do, is talk about the things of the cosmos and so forth and so on. So it refers to a way of thinking. By contrast, the mindset on the spirit refers to reception of divine viewpoint which for us all began at salvation. For some of us, we were saved, and, but we were not in a healthy spiritual environment because sound doctrine was not the order of the day. Legalism, emotionalism, and just flat false doctrinal teaching mixed together with things that are true. 
Because someone says something that's true, that's just one thing they said it's true about God and his plan. It has to be carried forward. <clears throat> the byproduct of occupation with the directive will of God, Paul says, is life, spiritual dynamic, a new life, under doctrine, and peace. You have peace in two ways. You are at peace with God and you are and you have and share inner peace. Life includes the imputation of eternal life, fellowship with God, and like-minded believers. Temporal blessings, dying grace if you die, and eternal rewards. The Christian way of life is a new life. It breaks from the world system. You're, you're in the world as a believer, but you're not of it. You're sharing a completely different destiny. Peace includes the doctrine of reconciliation. Separate doctrine on that. Uh, that we're reconciled to God through the work of Jesus Christ, where prior to salvation, all are spiritually estranged from God. They have no relationship with God, no viable relationship. An inner peace that is not contingent on circumstances. Jesus promised his disciples this peace. You can have this peace. You have to have, be in fellowship, in prayer, and in doctrine to have peace in the midst of the struggles of life. John 14, 25. And following. These things Jesus says to his disciples, I have spoken to you while abiding with you. The idea is that Jesus would not be with them in person, that he would be going elsewhere. <laughs> and they would be left behind in the world, but they wouldn't be on their own. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And that is reflected in the fact that we have four Gospels. And those four individuals record the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ. And they could not have ever done that because we can't remember everything. We don't get everything straight. So the Holy Spirit supernaturally revealed to these authors of the four Gospels, the life of Christ. Then he goes on to say, peace I leave with you. And that, of course, is related to the Holy Spirit who is now, for lack of a better term, subbing for Jesus Christ in the absence of Jesus Christ's personal person with his disciples. It's the Holy Spirit who has been given to us at salvation, who reveals to us incrementally divine viewpoint, the will of God, if you will, commandments, doctrines, as we work our way through Scripture. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. The world can have a kind of peace if things are going right with them, they can have peace, but it's easy if something untowards happens to the individual to upset that peace and throw them in a, in, a, in a spin. We have this peace. We It is called elsewhere in the Bible, peace that surpasses all comprehension. People tell me, I've experienced it in various difficult situations. You just have inner peace. The doctrine and the Holy Spirit is functioning in your soul so you are not breaking down, falling apart, etc. You can have peace in the face of bad things, bad news, whatever you want to call it. You've got to collect yourself, not feed off of your STA grid. We'll get to fear later on to break, to break the, the fear factor. 
it is nice to know that it is not God's will for you and I to operate under fear. I know it sounds like a large, maybe impossible order, but God doesn't give us commands and directives that we can't do. So the peace Jesus gives is not as the world gives to you. I think of a bumper sticker. Life is good. Until all hell breaks loose. Until some tragedy or event occurs. Then is life good? For the believer who goes through various things in life, life can be that of inner peace. Inner tranquility. The more doctrine you get, the more experience you get, the better you'll get at it. You won't be perfect. We have examples in the Bible of believers, good believers, who got under fear, got under their fear grid, and, and so forth. They, they had to deal with this. But when you get on top of it, you can go through these kinds of things with inner peace. Lots of doctrines come into play one of which is, don't forget it, of all the chaos and evil that is in our world and in our country, Jesus Christ controls history, not men. So I would encourage you to pray accordingly. I've been praying that God will continue to throw a monkey wrench, where appropriate, into the lives of these evildoers that are out there doing what they're doing today in positions of power and authority. And he can do it. He can do it. So pray that God will use individuals or circumstances to de derail some of their evil. Do that. Keep that in your prayer list under the heading that we're to pray for those who are responsible in the civil realm for law and order so we can go about our business and our business is so we can be uninterrupted for the large part from following the godliness code. The godliness code is what you need to adhere to. It is where your ultimate and eternal and personal blessings reside. Get your eyes off of, well, I need to do that. Well, I need to, no, 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 no. You need to keep your head down, take in Bible doctrine, do whatever you do out there during the regular work day and associate with believers that are an encouragement to you. And then he says, do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Well, that's a, that's a directive. The disciples did stumble when Jesus was arrested and went through the ordeal that he went through. Their hearts were troubled. They were fearful. They broke company with him, and they, the authorities weren't after them. They were after Jesus. The authorities thought if they take Jesus down, this whole thing will break up. Well, they were dead wrong, weren't they? It didn't. The disciples momentarily were miserable. They didn't sit around and say, Jesus told us that this was going to happen, and on the third day he'd be raised up, and away we go. So let's, let's relax. Let's enjoy the ride. But no, there was the, the, the fear factor, that is what is called self-induced misery. You do it to yourself. But you can break it. Claim God's promises. Learn what his promises are. He never violates his promises. And he's got you this far, he'll get you that to the next stage. Come what may, he's, he's factored it all in. And as we'll get to eventually, that great verse in Romans, he works all things together for good to those who love God. So step back, let God take care of it. Some things you just have to put with him and let him work it out. Try, quit trying to be going to fix everything. You're not going to fix everything. You're going to fix anything. 
You're going to faith the rest of, go through what you have to go through, keep your head up, stay in doctrine, stay in Bible class. The things that trip people up, it just blows my mind. But I've reported them again and again. The things that trip people up. Of course, it's a, their STAs are involved that throw them off course. It's very interesting, the depth of Jesus' understanding. And he's dealing with, he's, he's talking to the disciples who, uh, they're not on point yet. Oh, they believe he's the Messiah. They're all excited. They loved his miracles. They know, they, they can tell you the gospel, but they don't see the necessity of the cross. What? I mean, it's easy for us to sit up here and say that. They were raised up in their religious beliefs that the Messiah would come and defeat all of Israel's enemies and make Israel a great nation and everything, but they were not taught that the Messiah would come to his own people and his own people would repudiate him ultimately. But that wasn't going to change the plan of God. He was going to provide a way of salvation through his that rejection and all that he went through. <clears throat> so Jesus promised his disciples inner peace. It is commanded, Colossians 3.15. <clears throat> Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. To enjoy inner peace, the believer must focus on God's promises and plan. 22, and use what, I call, what we call the faith rest technique. That's just to rest in God and trust in him like a child trusts their parent to do the right thing and help them through things. In verse 7, Paul proceeds to relate a truth previously taught. Verse 13, namely, that the flesh, with its residence in nature, is totally hostile to God. It's just, it's just a teaching in the Bible. The STA, which you and I get up with every day and have within us, is incorrigible. In a way... You potentially are your own worst enemy if you pander to that sin nature. It's lusts, it's desires, and all the rest of it that it tries to superimpose on us. <clears throat> that was back in 713, uh, I believe, yeah. Uh, that is utterly sinful. Namely, that the flesh with its residence in nature is hostile to God and his plan. <clears throat> that should be, I think that should be verse 8a under point 23. The hostility of the indwelling sin nature toward God is seen in the fact that, quote, it does not subject itself to the law of God. 25, furthermore, it is incapable of doing so, 7C. That 7A was okay, I think, yeah, I'm sorry, that's, that, that was okay. Furthermore, it is incapable of doing so. 26, and he adds in verse eight, the fact that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The unbeliever cannot achieve divine approbation and the carnal believer cannot achieve divine good and divine approbation. So if that's what you want, if you want to live your life and please God, just stick with where you're at, keep doing what you're doing, and you are on that path to please God and reap the rewards. The rewards are spiritual rewards, inner peace, 
illustrative. Happiness, joy in the Lord, uh, material blessings and deliverances, and SG3. So he says, and goes on to say, the status quo of the believer versus the unbeliever. I didn't head this up with anything. Maybe I, I guess I dropped the ball there. I did put a header on it. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, he says to the Roman Christians. The Roman Christians were a minority within the great, mighty, big, bad capital city of the Roman Empire, in the heart of the beast, so to speak. These believers, and their names will be given, a bunch of them here at the end of the book, individual believers who stood out, who came out from not physically, but came out from their background and embraced the gospel. Threw overboard their Roman deities and superstitions and practices and embraced Christianity in the heart of the empire. However, you are not in the, fle in the flesh, but in the spirit. <clears throat> but you are not in, present active indicative, linear action, you are not in F the STA, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. That's just another statement in the Bible that believers have what is called here the Spirit of Christ. It's called the Spirit of Christ because Jesus Christ promised his disciples that upon his departure, he would send them the spirit to which that, er, that early group prayed and the spirit came on the day of Pentecost. And all believers since that time are possessors of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of God at salvation. He does not, this one does not have or belong, linear action, present indicative, have this one, uh, and is not, is not, does not belong to him. Moving on. If Christ is in you, that's a first class condition and he is. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the body is dead because of sin, Paul's theology, we'll try to work it out here for you. <clears throat> the body is dead because of sin, comes back to the sin nature, yet the spirit, the human spirit, is alive because of righteousness, imputed righteousness. The human spirit is an essential part of the makeup of a believer. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, another first class condition, and it does, what is one of the upshots of this? He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. One, believers by way of contrast to unbelievers that should be cannot please God since they are in a possession of an internal dynamic that over, uh, in other words, okay, let me see. Believers by way of contrast can please God. I'm off, I'm off, I'm off, as you were. Since they are in a position uh, of an internal dynamic that overrules the sin nature, checks it. That dynamic is the indwelling Holy Spirit designed to isolate the STA when a believer is in fellowship. The Christian way of life is a supernatural way of life. We are supernaturally indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And one of the things he does for us is to enable us to come out from under momentarily the rule of the flesh, the sin nature. Three, believers are not in the flesh like their unbelieving counterparts. The line of being ruled by the STA is broken at salvation. And then if you get doctrine and start learning how to get and stay in fellowship, then you begin to be able to check 
this thing that dwells within all of us. In the spirit, in verse 9, refers is a reference to the new ruler of life under conditions of the filling ministry. It, we are commanded to be filled with the spirit. He uses an illustration. If someone's under the control of too much alcohol, they get drunk, inebriated, and do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. He uses that, that sin because alcohol affects in the wrong amounts, depending on the individual, uh, the central nervous system, affecting people's movement, speech, and other factors, judgment, and so forth. So it becomes a good illustration for uh, something that is ruling someone. Six, being in the spirit and being indwelt with the spirit is two different things. When John says that he was in the spirit in Revelation 1.10, it means that he was in fellowship. And of course, in addition to that, he was caught up and given this, I say caught up, not literally, physically. But in the theater of his mind, he was given incrementally the book of Revelation. Virtual reality, we'll call it. He saw all of this that you read about in Revelation. He saw this like on a movie screen, but it's inside of him while he was on the island of Patmos. The entire phenomenal book of Revelation was revealed to this man while he was a prisoner in a work camp on the Isle of Patmos, the Mediterranean Ocean. They can do things to believers, but they can't shut positive believers down from a, from a dynamic. What do they put us to do? We got, we've got doctrine in our soul, and we can, and we can deal with it. Anyway. <clears throat> only the person who is indwelt with the Spirit can be, quote, in the sphere of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. The second sentence of verse 9 serves to highlight the fact that only believers in Jesus Christ have the indwelling Holy Spirit. 10. Spirit of God and Spirit of Christ are one and the same. Spirit of Christ is to be understood that the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit functions in a subordinate fashion to God the Father and God the Son. Philippians 1.19, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance to your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul knew that he was going to be released. Somehow, he just knew that God was revealed to him somehow that he was going to be released from his first Roman imprisonment. But while he was in that imprisonment, he wrote Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. He wrote those books. You cannot keep the word of God in bound. God worked through him to give us these great letters. God the Holy Spirit was sent by Christ on the day of Pentecost. John 16, 7, but I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And also those other verses in that regard. This was a very special blessing for the believers of this dispensation. The universal indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, union with Jesus Christ, constituting us something royal family. You are royalty. You get doctrine, you can act like royalty. You have a royal destiny. Christ is royalty. He's a king. You're in union with him. You share his royalty. The church is analogous to, the, to a husband and a bride. The bride is royalty too. You were given that at salvation. It's the highest ranking royalty that exists in all systems of royalty. You're going to... You, uh, <clears throat> So, just as the Father sent the Son, so the Son sent the Father. Now, all three members of the Godhead are co-equal and co-eternal. 
One isn't greater than the other, okay? They all share the same invisible attributes. They all share absolute sovereignty. They all share eternal life. They all share love. These are attributes. They all share plus R, righteousness, absolute. They all share, share justice. They all are immutable. They don't change. They don't improve because they can't improve. They're perfect. And veracity. And then the three O's. They're all omnipotent. They don't share omnipotence. They're equally omnipotent. They're all omnipresent. <clears throat> omnipresent, omnipotent. Uh, these are the these attributes they all share. But there is a chain of command within the Godhead. The Father is the author or planner, so to speak. Jesus Christ is under the authority of his Father, both in his deity and his humanity. And God the Holy Spirit as well. I might have left out omniscience. That's pretty important because nothing's hidden from God. Past, present, or future, currently, he doesn't find out stuff. There might be language of accommodation like that in the Bible, but it's not to be taken literally that God discovered something. He knew it from eternity past. That's coming up in Romans 2. He knew you would come on the scene, and he knew every little thing about you. From your birth all the way through. Know everything. Know all your thoughts, all your attitudes, every moment, 24-7. Otherwise, how could God judge us righteously in a final judgment of our works? How would he know if we were all, when we were in fellowship, when we're not? He's all-knowing. <clears throat> the second sentence of verse 9 states in negative terms what was implied in the first sentence. Namely, if a person does not have the Holy Spirit, that person is not a believer. We don't ask for the Holy Spirit. If they did before the coming of the Holy Spirit and the universal indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we don't do that anymore. We don't ask for the Spirit. We have it 24-7. So try not to grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. That's what sin does. And if you do, rebound quickly. Get back in fellowship. Get your thinking back straight. You pop out of fellowship because you're under fear over something, whatever it is. Fear of bad weather. Fear of fill in the blank. That statement could only be true if every believer has the Holy Spirit. The words, this one is not his, literal Greek, leaves no doubt that such a person is outside the plan of God. Jude 19. These are those who cause divisions, worldly minded, devoid of the Spirit. Because he's it's a prophecy that in the last days, in the last days, there will rise up those who will attack the Bible. Academics, different type people will attack the Bible. They're called mockers. Uh, they will be mockers, following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions. Worldly minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, you, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life.
This little short letter was written because Jude, 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 the author here, he's the half, he's the half brother of Jesus. Jude. He had, had another half brother called James, wrote the book of James. They weren't believers when Jesus was raised up among them. They became believers after the resurrection. Members of his own family did not, some, did not get saved until afterwards. They were not believing in him during his public ministry with all the evidence, but they did come around. James and Jude. Just throw, I thought I'd throw that in. <clears throat> we are not to ask for the Holy Spirit as he is given to us and will be for us, with us forever as is the practice of some religious types out there that are asking people to ask for the Holy Spirit. You are given the Holy Spirit when you believed in Christ. It didn't involve your consent. It was an automatic giving of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit along with the human spirit. And that's a big deal as it turns out. Without him, we could not effectively learn doctrine and be led into all truth. In verse 10, we have the indwelling of Christ, which is different than the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of Christ refers to Bible doctrine in the human spirit via gap, which I have presented to you on many occasions, many times. Because one of the, one of the ways the word Christ is used is doctrine. I'll give you an example. I don't know the exact verse offhand. He says, you have not so learned the Christ. You know a person by being around them, what they think, and so forth. So this is made possible by the indwelling and filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, where, of course, there is positive volition. It is the Holy Spirit that reveals divine viewpoint to the one who is teachable, John 16. And now we've been through the whole Gospel of John back in the day, but we revisit things because it's, it's, it's necessary. John 16, 14 and 15. Speaking of the Spirit, he will glorify me, for he will take a mine and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said, that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. He's telling the disciples, the Holy Spirit is going to be your teacher after I'm out of here. And he will make everything clear to you. And he did. If Christ is in you, e.g., we have the mind of Christ, assumes that this is the case with the Roman Christians as they had had, at that time, the capacity to appreciate this epistle. It wasn't over their head. Obviously, they learned things from it, but it wasn't over their head. The phrase, though the body is dead because of sin, refers to the physical death of a believer. Are you with me? Though the body is dead because of sin. Sin refers to to the death gene passed down from Adam. The words, the spirit is alive, refers to the human spirit created at salvation. The human spirit remains alive, even in the face of physical death, as it would make no sense to assert the Holy Spirit is alive because of righteousness. It's alive no matter what. I know it's tricky, just be patient. Righteousness here refers to imputed righteousness, which qualifies the person to have an eternal relationship with God who possesses the attribute of absolute righteousness. That's all in the doctrine of justification. Note Romans 8.16 for the interaction between the human spirit and the Holy Spirit. All right, we'll pick this up next time, which will be the 26th, by the way. See you then. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us in Christ's name. Amen.